Thank you to the organisers for agreeing to let me talk to you virtually from sunny Southport. I hope my uh, my voice is quite clear at the moment. Yes, so I take it as yes. And I'm here to talk to you about management of children and adolescents with diabetes and what uh, the GP needs to know. I've only been given 20 minutes, so it's going to be a whistle-stop uh, tour of uh, the important things that I think GP needs to know. So here are my affiliations. I'm asked to leave this for at least 30 seconds, but, uh, but I've been involved in many national and international roles in uh, diabetes and endocrinology, and I've been involved for the past three years on the NICE guideline uh, development for diabetes for both uh, children and adults. I've got no conflict of interest to declare. So the important thing with diagnosis of diabetes is to be aware of the diagnostic criteria, which is fasting blood glucose of greater than seven millimoles or a two hour post glucose load with 75 grams of 11.1 millimoles or an HbA1c of greater than 48 millimoles, which is 6.5%. This is based on the World Health Organization classification. And you can see on the table, there are many types of diabetes, type one diabetes, type two hybrid forms, monogenic diabetes, unclassified diabetes, gestational diabetes, neonatal diabetes. Regardless of the types of diabetes, your diagnostic criteria is for you to be aware of not missing out on a diagnosis. Um, I've published in the past as well, there are many conditions that may have the diagnostic criteria of getting a fasting or a two-hour post-glucose blood glucose that is high. And this can be in conditions where you get transiently raised blood glucose from illness. It's been evidence in asthma, severe asthma patients, in intensive care illnesses, and particularly in neonatal uh, intensive care where stress or steroid induced can actually cause significant rises in your blood glucose. We know that the human cost of diabetes is huge. NHS spends around 10 billion a year on complications of diabetes, about 10% of its budget. It's a leading cause of non-traumatic lower extremity amputations. It's a leading cause of blindness in working age adults. It's a leading cause of end-stage renal disease, and it's significantly associated with cardiovascular mortality and stroke. And if you're not aware of the most recent type 1 diabetes index globally, if you, can, if you want to search that, you can search on any part of the globe and you can see the impact of the cost of diabetes can be in each country. A life expectancy is expected to be reduced by 23 years for a patient that is diagnosed with type 1 diabetes under the age of 10 years old. A little bit of a background to type 1 diabetes in children, its incidence and its prevalence is rising. We've been seeing this over the past decade. In, the, in England and Wales, we have almost 100% submission to our National Pediatric Diabetes Audit. This is approximately 185 diabetes children's center. And there are only about 29,200 children with type one diabetes and only 550 type two diabetes in children and young people under the age of 18. So it's not a lot compared to the adult population, but we are still the highest number of young people under 14 in Europe. And this is based on the IDF Federation statistics from 2019. We're also seeing a rise in under fives. We have quite a lot of under five year olds now with type one diabetes. And one of the things that you'll see is the challenges involved in optimizing their glycemic management. This is uh, an interesting data of over 10 years for median HbA1c in children and young people with all types of diabetes, bearing in mind that 90% 90 
or more of them, is type 1 diabetes in children and young people. And we started off with a really high HbA1c in 2009 and 10 from our NPDA audit of about 73 millimoles per mole, which is about 9%. And we're now down to 61 millimoles per mole, which is about 7.9%. And this has been down to a real a decade of initiatives that's been started by the Department of Health, by NHS England, by regional networks. We've had networks being established in England and Wales. We've had best practice tariff, which is one of them. It probably is the highest tariff for any childhood condition. So the best practice tariff for diabetes is higher than in oncology, cystic fibrosis, asthma, epilepsy. We've had national delivery plans to improve our outcomes for children and young people of the past year, having diabetes, QIs and QAs. Uh, we regularly have annual external visits to look at our quality standards and to look at our QI and methodologies to improve our children's outcomes in type 1 diabetes particularly. However, you can see from this slide that there is what we call the UK adolescent bulge. Most of the high mean HbA1c's that we see across the NPDA, National Pediatric Diabetes Audit, is in our adolescent group. So from about 12 to 18 plus, we have our highest mean HbA1c's in our NPDA audit. And, and we know why. There is a huge psychological impact of having type 1 diabetes in children, young people, and even adults. Now, I was meant to be here face to face, and you know I can't point to anyone to give me the answers, but, but let's try and do this. Uh, a 15-year-old, this is case presentations that you will see at your GP surgeries, presents to you with vague central abdominal pain, respiratory rate that is increased of 30 per minute history of tightness and you test her and you find that she has glycosuria so you test her urine and she's got ketonuria what are your thoughts so as we're talking diabetes i'm sure you would have guessed that this is diabetic ketoacidosis one of the important things for you to be aware of is that as per NICE guidance, NG18, for children and young people, your patient should be referred on the same day to the pediatric team for management of DKA, referred to the same day to a pediatric emergency department, and this patient requires insulin and fluids started as per NICE protocol. This is quite important because we Historically, and I've been practicing for over 20 years, we see DKA being admitted because of delayed diagnosis. In our next case presentation, we have another nine-year-old known type 1 diabetes attending your practice for her annual flu jab. She suddenly collapses in the waiting room, pulse rate is high, tachycardic, the nurse checks the blood glucose and it's 1.9 millimoles. So my question to you at your surgery practices is, do you have anything that would treat her? The answer is yes, you should have a hypo box nearby. We have this everywhere in the wards and diagnosis is she has severe hypoglycemia. There should be glucagon, at least one milligram IM administered if unconscious. And as per NICE guidance, her blood glucose should be rechecked after 15 minutes because the incidence of having rebound hypoglycemia can be quite high, depending on the reasons for this. Blood sugars, if they don't increase sufficiently, then you can give another lot of glucagon, but really call for an ambulance and admission for further assessment. I mentioned Kaipo boxes. These are available in all our hospitals, in our outpatients departments, in all the wards. Um, we do expect that uh, it should be readily available in your GP surgeries because if conscious, 
Treatment can be administered with a rapid-acting carbohydrate, such as dextrose tablets, glucose juice. If you don't have any of those, a fizzy drink that is not diet or not sugar-free or pure fruit juice are used in many um, low-middle-income countries. Importantly, these are fast-acting, rapid-acting carbohydrates. They are preferred rather than giving them a chocolate or a cake because anything that contains fat proteins causes delay of glucose going into the bloodstream. So an important aspect is recognizing diabetic ketoacidosis. Recognize that Capillary glucose needs to be checked in anyone presenting to your consultation with increased thirst, increased urination, excessive tiredness, unexplained weight loss, and any of the following, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, hyperventilation, dehydration, decreased level of consciousness. The latter symptoms are really due to acidity, blood acidity, as well as ketosis that has occurred further down the line. DKA is life-threatening. It can develop quite quickly within 24 hours. And again, as I've mentioned, as per NICE, urgent admission should be arranged for the same day. It's associated with significant comorbidities such as cerebral edema, neurocognitive deficits, shock, arrhythmia, and death. And for children and young people with type 1 diabetes, again, as per NICE guidance, all of them are provided education from diagnosis around sick days management to prevent diabetic ketoacidosis. Sick days always happens. They can get a flu, a cough, COVID, abdominal gastrointestinal infections, and illness rises your blood or your cortisol, your hormones that actually fights infection. And that itself rises blood glucose levels and increases the risk of ketone production. So most, in fact, all children and young people and most adults are actually provided education on how to manage sick days to prevent DKA. So this would be encouraging them to drink, monitoring their bloods hourly, increasing their insulin administration according to a particular protocol that we give them, but not to miss DKA in any of these circumstances. So this is sick days. That is uh, our national guideline. This is the ACDC, as well as the British Society of Pediatric and Endocrinology Diabetes, and combined with the National Diabetes uh, Network. And families are provided with this guideline and I've earlier mentioned that illness increases blood glucose levels, increases cortisol, increases ketone production due to a relative insufficiency of insulin because of your counter-regulatory hormones. This causes lipolysis, breakdown of fat, which then increases your production of ketones and ketones are acidic. And to prevent DKA, if you can look at the table, I'm afraid this is blocking you a bit, but we have our green, amber, red guidance for young people and uh, children and families to manage sick days. And the website's there, acdc.org. They can download it. It's uh, free to download. Uh, there's, there's no barriers to accessing ACDC guidelines. And they're advised on how to monitor and how to administer extra insulin. For example, if their ketones were between 0 0.6 to 1.5 millimoles per liter, they would be giving 10% of their total daily insulin or 0.1 units of their body weight as additional fast-acting insulin. And they will keep doing this every two hours. Important thing, seek advice early and do not stop insulin. Even if their blood glucose are sometimes on the low end and they're concerned about hypoglycemia, low blood glucose, the advice is still 
to continue insulin, but sometimes add sugar to their drinks. And if their ketones are very, very high and this is not improving, the important message is to get them to the nearest a &E. You will rarely see newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes, but and you see lots and lots of children and young people with viral infections and flus. But I, I, it's just for you to be really aware, especially with someone with known type 1 diabetes, that DKA can happen very quickly, within hours, and not to miss that. Preventing type 1, uh, preventing diabetic ketoacidosis at diagnosis is one of our aims. Our, the healthcare professional groups involved in children and young people with type 1 diabetes. One of our aims is really to try and reduce the incidence of diabetic ketoacidosis at diagnosis. You can see that across all the regions, we are around 24% nationally of getting diabetic ketoacidosis diagnosis at the start. What we want is to get this down to zero. In parts of Europe, the incidence of DK8 diagnosis is less than 10%. Now, there is a discussion at the moment about whether we should be screening so that we make families aware that this type 1 diabetes is going to happen. We just don't know when, uh, but that's another debate uh, for another time. But one in four at the moment is presenting to our a &E department with diabetic ketoacidosis, which is life-threatening. And it has implications to costs. They're admitted to intensive care unit or high dependency unit, and they spend usually a week in hospital. As opposed to diagnosing them without diabetic ketoacidosis at diagnosis based on any of the screening criteria earlier mentioned. The prevalence of all types of type, all types of diabetes have been increasing, both type 1 and type 2. I've mentioned that international comparison comparisons shows that DK rates in England and Wales are much higher than in other parts of Europe, such as Germany and Austria. In the UK, for our 2017 to 2019. National Diabetes Audit, there were 25,000 approximately who had emergency DKA admissions. 76% were those with type 1, 19% with type 2. And we see the highest rates of DKA admissions between the ages of 18 to 24, with a peak age of 19. Most of these individuals, and that's another evidence that would have seen a GP prior to their emergency admission in hospital. So in 2015 to 2016, the UK did uh, develop this uh, poster, the four T's. It would have been in your GP practices. And this was modeled on the Vanelli Italian poster campaign to recognize for, for, it was not just for families and the lay people and the public, but it was also for GPs and healthcare professionals to recognize type 1 diabetes. The four T's refers to toileting, thirsty, tired, and thinner. And if any child has these, one or all of them, think diabetes and think type 1 diabetes. Unfortunately, the publications I've noted here, Townsend, Delami, Vanelli, Cherubini, have shown minimal improvements despite these poster campaigns. And we don't quite understand why. I, probably one of the hypotheses is that you just don't see it often enough. 29,000 children in the whole of UK of 70 million. You might not see one for years. Now, this is type 1 diabetes, NICE guidance, NG18. It's just for you to be aware of the recent changes from April 2022. The recommended target is 6.5, less than 6.5. This is equivalent then to reducing the risk of complications 
as to someone without diabetes. Blood glucose targets should be between 4 to 7 before meals and 5 to 9 after meals. All newly diagnosed children and young people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes are started on a multiple daily insulin regimen. The old term is the basal bolus regimen. And all of them should be provided with level 3 carb counting. So as soon as they're diagnosed, if they're not in diabetic ketoacidosis, they start their education in hospital with carb counting, allowing insulin adjustments according to the amount of carbohydrates they eat. All of them are also offered insulin pumps according to their choice. For those requiring blood glucose strips and not yet on real-time glucose monitoring, blood glucose should be monitored more than five times a day and up to 10 times a day or more if on insulin. Real-time CGM is now offered to all children and adults based on the NICE 2022 guidelines. So NG17 was the NICE guidelines for adults, and that was published in June of 2022, which offers real-time continuous glucose monitoring to everyone with type 1 diabetes. I know many of the GPs now are already from at least two years ago prescribing intermittent scan glucose monitoring or FLASH, the Libra, but now CGM like Dexcom 1 uh, will now be prescribable. It's important to provide children, young people and adults actually with enough test strips to take capillary blood glucose measurements. This is important because even if they do have a continuous glucose monitoring system, whether it's a Dexcom, Medtronic sensor or a Libra flash, they still need test strips because there is a difference between subcutaneous glucose sensing and blood glucose sensors. And sometimes we ask families and the young people to re recheck it if they're uncertain about a definitive hypoglycemia. Because sometimes you can have a malfunctioning with the CGM or inaccuracies getting more inaccurate with their CGMs and they are asked to recheck it with the blood glucose testing. Patients and carers are also taught how to manage hypo, low and hypo, high blood glucose, ketone strips and meters are prescribed by the GPs and they're advised to check for ketonemia if unwell. So ketone testing and blood ketone testing, not urine ketone testing, is the standard of care now and part of sick days management. It's also important that they all have access to mental health services. For children and young people, because of best practice tariff, we all actually have uh, a psychologist in our teams. Annual monitoring is also very important and they commence for retinopathy, particularly from the age of 12 years old. Uh, I'm running slightly ahead of time. So quickly, a case presentation of uh, this young South Indian child complaining of increased skin infections and urine dipstick is negative for ketones, but he is overweight, normal blood pressure, but has these uh, skin lesions called acanthosis nigricans. These are hyperpigmentation on the creases of the skin and associated with insulin resistance. And he has type 2 diabetes. Again, the NICE guidance is to refer urgently to the pediatric diabetes team. We start metformin as a first line and we provide structured education as well as the usual annual review monitoring. HbA1c target for type 2 diabetes in children is the same, which is less than 48 millimoles, 6.5%. Incidence of type 2 in young Children and young adolescents are increasing globally. We're seeing similar increase in the US, Europe, and the US are also seeing an incidence of increasing of pre-diabetes. This is our National Pediatric Diabetes Audit for Type 2. If you remember, it is a very small number compared to adults, which is around 795 now. 
but there is an overrepresentation of Asians relationship with the deprivation quintiles. So the most deprived has a higher incidence of type 2. There's a female preponderance and almost all of them have a family history of type 2 diabetes. The outcomes for youths with type 2 diabetes is actually worse than someone with type 1 diabetes because they have a higher risk of morbidity, ischemic heart disease, stroke. And the graph on the lower right shows that there is an inverse relationship between the age of onset with complication risk and standardized mortality rates. So type 2 diabetes in children are very different to type 2 diabetes being diagnosed in later years. 50 onwards. Type 2 diabetes in children has a far worse outcome compared to type 1 diabetes in children. This is a family history that is quite high for anyone with type 2 diabetes. Investigation for type 2 diabetes from our NPDA audit shows that 51% of patients had high blood pressure above the 98th centile, 23% were also high, 92% were obese, and lipids were raised in 32% for high total cholesterol and 40% high triglycerides. And we previously talked about uh, fatty liver. This is We see this quite commonly in ch children and young people when they're diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Those with raised ALT, 91% had fatty liver, and those with normal ALT, 68% still had fatty liver. The median, as you can see from the uh, graph on the right, whilst type 2 diabetes median HbA1c from the NPDA audit is still better at 52 than the most compared to around 70 around 7.9% for type 1. 92% uh, of those who were obese were still obese on follow-up. And lifestyle modification is always given, plus metformin, plus insulin, if those are needed. And 0.5% of them, we are adding some of the unlicensed medications like GLP-1s, DPP-4s, and SGLT-2s. Nice guidance for type 2 diabetes is summarized here. Recommended target is still the same as type 1. Structured education is provided from diagnosis. Important to be aware that dietary advice is given in a sensitive way as some cultural and social factors needs to be considered when giving dietary advice. Metformin is the first-line therapy and offered to everyone diagnosed to all type 2s in children and young people. And again, increased risk of psychological issues are noted with both type 1 and type 2 children and young people. Their annual monitoring is similar. And for those vast majority who are also obese, we consider the obesity assessments in accordance to NICE guidance 184, looking at, for example, ambulatory BP, sleep studies, lipid management, etc. So my last slide here, key learning points for GPs is to be aware of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, recognizing the signs and symptoms of DKA in those who are known with type 1 diabetes. Be aware of sick days management for prevention of DKA. You'll be involved in prescribing test strips, lancets, insulin, CGM. So to be aware as well, not to limit them. You'll also be soon prescribing CGMs, Dexcom 1s, Flash, Libras are already happening. Access to psychological services are available through the secondary care services. Know how to manage hypoglycemia confidently. This can happen anytime at your surgery. And for type 2 diabetes, recognize the symptoms and signs because we are seeing them more and more. 
we are we have a 15% increase in incidence every year due to possibly rise in obesity as well so thank you very much and i hope i have time for questions mm -hmm.